In today's video, I talk to Right Honourable Sir Robert Buckland, KBE KC MP. Robert is the MP for South Swindon and Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Autism. Robert has recently led the Buckland Review, which was published by the Department for Work and Pensions, which highlights the key areas of where things need to improve when it comes to autism and employment. Today I talk to him regarding the review and what his experience of autism is, what implications could a Labour government have on the group and what made him want to become the chair of the all-party parliamentary group on autism. Hey guys and welcome to a very special episode of the Maxi Aspi series, the Autism Connection Series 5 and I had to do a bonus episode because out of all the stuff that I do for autism, a lot of it is always governed by government. You know, it's all the policies, everything that comes down from the top and I thought who better to have on the show than the chairman of the Autism All Parliamentary Group. Today on the show, we have Sir Robert Buckland. Hi, Robert. Thank you for joining us on the Autism Connections today. I always start the show by asking the person that is on, what is your connection to autism? Well, my connections are many. First and foremost, I'm a parent of a young woman who's autistic. She's uh, nearly 22 and uh, I've been on a journey uh, learning about autism and understanding better the needs of people who are autistic. And then uh, professional because of the work that I did in, in the criminal law representing people who often turned out to have a and needed a diagnosis um, and now political representing many families who um, have autistic members who need support and help. So. Uh, in three ways, I've been working uh, on the issue of autism for many years. Well, as I say, we met back in 2016 when we were doing the National Autistic uh, Society campaign, Could You Stand a Rejection, which focused around employment. Um, yes. And I always remember meeting you and I always remember, uh, you know, I met a lot of MPs that day, but I remember having a conversation with you and just we, I just clicked with you instantly because I felt like you 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 cared. You know, it's very very uh, rare to some sometimes meet people and and not get that they get it. And I felt that you did. So obviously, when it was ran by Cheryl Gillian Blasso, who's no longer with us now, um, we actually dedicated one of these uh, series to her because of the work that she did in Parliament. Um, yes. When I heard that you are now the chair of the autism all party group i i was obviously couldn't think of anyone better so you know it it really was amazing when you got that and obviously off the back of that we've just now released you've just now wrote up the um the buckland report which is focusing on autism and employment so what was yeah. the sort of surprising things for you that you found out during that that report and what do you hope will change you know with that report going forward well, I think the initial shock of the fact that under three in 10 autistic adults have a job at all is shocking. And that statistic is well below the disability average of five out of 10. And the, uh, the rest of the population, eight out of 10, there's a huge gap there. And we identified nearly 700,000 people who have autism as a, some form of diagnosis who are not being given the chance to work. And that doesn't include all the people who perhaps don't have a diagnosis, don't realise and uh, perhaps have never been identified and that will add up to many hundreds of thousands more. So we're talking about a big chunk of people who uh, are missing out on opportunities. What was good, I think, was that we found pockets of really good practice, businesses, even sectors of the economy, uh, the insurance sector, doing some really good things on this and um, just rethinking the way that they recruit and retain autistic people so much to be worried about much to be encouraged about the key for me was trying to bring all this together 
to provide a coherent answer to this problem and some solutions as to the way in which we can tackle this gap. Yeah, and I think the report really highlights that emphasis on the employers because throughout my life, I've always been told to change and mask and adapt, you know, and I've had to go through my life sort of trying to fit in these sort of shapes, you know, that they want. So it's 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 sort of putting the onus back on on the employer, you know, how how can they make it more easy, which I think your report highlights really, really well. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. And it's 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 about the wider economy adapting. I'm not asking for lots of law or lots of government money, which sounds good, but actually doesn't really hit the mark. I'm asking for a generational change. It's going to take a while, but we need to start somewhere and then we need to monitor that change, hold uh, the economy, if you like, to account, hold businesses to account and then mark where we are. So, you know, by the end of the decade, are we still going to be only three out of 10 or are we going to be four or five out of 10? Uh, this will take time, but we've got to get a plan together. And that's what I think my report represents. Absolutely. And, you know, I remember when I first started my sort of campaigning, I originally went in for just an acting role because I was autistic. They wanted an autistic actor. And then mm. I was so sort of angry at that statistic, you know, because at the time I think it was 16% of autistic people in full time work. And then there was other statistics like 54% in volunteering and um, part time. And it was only when the Office of National Statistics statistics came out um a couple mm. of years later and said actually there's 22 percent of autistic people in any form of work me being a bit naive thought oh okay that the number's gone up but when i then contacted the national autistic society they actually said no that's that's in total you know so the part-time the volunteering that's everything so and i think the number is now at 30 percent of autistic people in any form of work yeah, that's right. Some of it is due to better identification of autistic people already in the workplace. I'm in favour of that. I think that does many good things. That reduces stigma. It uh, opens up awareness, uh, not just uh, on the part of the autistic person, but of the employer, uh, and shows that they can, you know, there can be ways of means of supporting people and embracing and celebrating the difference. Um, but ultimately, that's not changing as many lives as we want that's why now we've got to go beyond that sort of you know identification important though that is into a world where we are bringing people for, who are out of work into the workplace very often for the very first time absolutely and it's getting those key skills as well and i always say if you can't get it right from the ground up you know from school because at the moment, you know, there's a four year waiting list just to get a diagnosis. And then you hear the statistics of 50% of um, autistic people are more likely to be excluded from school. So you you start hearing these statistics and it, it and it paints a very sort of harrowing, you know, path for an autistic individual. Do you, what do you think is the, the sort of cause of that? Do you think it's lack of funding? Do you think it's um, the structure, the education system? I don't think it's funding. I think it's the availability of professionals who are suitably qualified to diagnose. I think it's uh, sometimes we put the money in the wrong part of the system. We're not necessarily doing it as early as we could. You know, we should be screening in early uh, infancy, uh, working with health visitors and equipping uh, them with the expertise uh, to either test or refer uh, and really getting it right in those early years so that we can identify the range of conditions that uh, you know are uh, called neurodiversity. Now in my, my report I focus on autism but this will have a wider impact on neurodiversity more generally and it's not designed to be exclusive. We had a lot of debate about whether we should actually call it neurodiversity uh, employment. In the end I think it was right of us to focus on autism uh, but you know i think everybody's understood and it's certainly been welcomed as such that this has wider uh, impact whilst i haven't uh, in the terms of reference of this report gone into the education system 
it's clear to me that there are aspects of the system, particularly the use of supported internships and apprenticeships and work experience uh, placements that are better adapted, that are really relevant uh, to young people coming out of school and into the world of work. The evidence shows that those supported work experience places are, are successful and they often lead on to a more permanent placement. So, so we've got some evidence that about, about what works. Let's use that. Yeah, and you know, I, that's how I, funny enough, started my career through an apprenticeship scheme. I found it one of the proudest things I was able to do was part of the green paper. I thought, um, you know, the level two qualifications which I needed for maths. Um, yeah. I took maths seven times. <laughs> you know, I wasn't very good. Um, eventually got there. But I could see a lot of people, if they were put in the same position, especially if they may think that I don't really need maths to do my job, you know, I could see a lot of people giving up. So I was really happy when the green paper came out that it was like you only needed a level one, you know, in that apprenticeship scheme to to actually then pass and do the job. Because I think there's a lot of things that we learn at school that you know, when we go into the real world, it's like, but I don't know how to write a resume. I don't know how to read a bank statement or, you know, those those fundamental key skills that some people miss when they go through the education system. That, that, that's right. And when you get to that stage, when you're preparing for the world of work, how best then, and not only can you prepare for that or you get help for that, but how can the system work more intelligently? So the interview system, for example, it's it's very much an ordeal, even if you're neurotypical it's an ordeal it's a bit of a memory test it can be a bit of a stressful time totally uh, antithetical to the interests of autistic people why does it have to be like that why 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 isn't there a more universal approach perhaps by notifying people about the type of questions you're going to be asked uh, not asking those rather abstract and open-ended questions not making assumptions about you know everybody having to be a quote good team player whatever that means um, and just really looking again at changing the way we interview. So, for example, on practical jobs, why not do a show and tell on the shop floor to show uh, the applicant what is needed and then to encourage the applicant to have a go at it themselves? All those changes, I think, will, won't just help people who have an identified diagnosis, but will help thousands of people who haven't got that and who might be wondering why it is that they, they are not able to secure that all important job uh, and, and i think then from there you know developing existing schemes like disability confidence and access to work which you know have been there but aren't working as well as they should frankly uh, i think we can start to get that change working with uh, existing employers confederations recruiters just changing the way in which we we operate uh, subtly but definitively in a way that i think will yield good results yeah, absolutely. I think it's about sort of sometimes working smarter and not harder, right? And, you know, a lot of people will probably be watching this thinking, no, it's definitely underfunded. But at the same time, I really appreciate your point of view, which is sometimes money isn't spent the best sort of way, you know, and that needs to be reevaluated. Um, it does. I mean, we talk about money in the abstract. What does it actually achieve? Uh, you know what does it do does it actually does that make the difference or does it does the does the, the the person at the other end of the interview does the company does the organization that's dealing with your application is that what's important i think i'm afraid well i'm not afraid i'm delighted to say that this is a review of the difference we haven't asked for lots of government money we haven't asked for more laws and quite right too because i think now is the time for politicians to actually enable industry and business to take up responsibility for what will be the change. Uh, I think the public sector can do more, of course I do, and there are plenty of good jobs there, uh, whether it's in GCHQ or the DWP itself, but ultimately the future of our country depends upon the private sector and that private economy which generates the revenue that pays for our public services. And I think autistic people want to and have a role to play, not just working for others, but setting up their own businesses as well and being given the support to be self-employed entrepreneurs, which I think suits the talent of very many autistic people. 
you know autistic people have so much potential and they often again i think it's stigma and stereotypes right that people just think they're not good enough or they're scared because they don't know how to support them and actually you know i know where i work now you know quote unquote my my work would often go your attention to detail or admin how everything's organized is really been imperative to the success of you know our 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 it team you know so um there's many strengths but a bit of a sort of personal question for yourself and feel free not to answer it if you don't if you don't want to but you know what made you get into you know be becoming an mp and what was it like and what was the trigger for you to start thinking about a diagnosis for your daughter well i think dealing with the last question first i think you know when you i had twins and you watch their milestones uh, and uh, the, you hit those milestones or you don't hit them and in my daughter's case, they weren't being hit. And, you know, you get reassurance that that's normal and natural. And then after some time, you think, well, actually, no, there's something happening here that we need help with. And it was a fight, actually, to get a diagnosis. We got one when she was about four or five, um, which, you know, I thought we could have reached about a year or so beforehand. Um, and then the statement followed. And from there, uh, support came. Um, but, you know, we've got this system where you've got to jump through hurdles and hoops to get that support. It seems to me that so many people can't wait. We can't afford to wait. We need to have a much more universal system that doesn't depend on that sort of uh, either, sh either hard fight by the parents or that type of uh, approach. Um, and secondly, on politics, I've always been interested and always been passionate about my politics from a young age. Uh, and I thought I had something to contribute. And through my work as a criminal barrister, as a lawyer for many years, my life experiences as a parent, uh, I felt that by the time I got elected about 14 years ago, I really had something to say about the world and about the country I lived in and about what I wanted to achieve from it, which is why I've been honoured not just to serve as South Swindon's MP, but to serve in Cabinet uh, and to be a minister for much of my time here in Parliament. But now as a backbencher once again, back in charge of the all party group i'm able to do what i most love which is campaign on issues that like autism that matter to me and when the prime minister asked me to do this review well actually i mean the truth is i demanded that i do it and he readily Good. agreed um it's been a positive experience with the support from the dwp autistica our leading research charity very much confirming not only the independence of this review, but the fact it is led by autistic people themselves. And that I was determined to make sure that it was going to be not about us without us. And, you know, that's why I'm really pleased that this review has got that distinct autism led flavour. And for you, obviously, with the election sort of coming up, will that sort of change the landscape of the um, autism all parliamentary group? You know, does that again? I'm not, I'm not massively in politics, but how does that sort of um, can that change the landscape of that of that group? It can. Um, uh, people will come and go. Um, I, I'm fighting my seat. I hope that I will be back. Um, I hope that we will be joined by new MPs with the same passion. I hope that the group goes from strength to strength. I've been honoured to lead it. Cheryl was an inspirational chair uh, who uh, took over after I left my first stint in the chair. Um, and I believe that the whoever, you know, if I'm there, I hope to be, uh, whoever's there will, I hope, show the same energy and sense of urgency about this issue that will not wait for many people. We're talking about lives now, not some theoretical future date. And that's why uh, thinking back to my dear friend, Cheryl, I'm, on, I'm trying to honor her memory in what we do uh, uh, in the group now. Yeah, and she, she was amazing. You know, I had a privilege of meeting her and speaking in front of her a few times. And again, she was, again, one of those other people who I met and just felt really cared. I recall her saying that she was rallying other parties when they were trying to get the Autism Act in in 2009. And, and you know, that collaboration, you know, two parties coming together can be quite rare. Indeed. 
but this is an issue that transcends party and it should transcend parliaments as well. Uh, this is something that everybody needs to get behind. The report is enjoying cross-party endorsement. I want the government now in the debate that we're doing in April to endorse its recommendations, the 19 recommendations we have, and then we could get the task group going and really steam ahead with uh, the proposals to get them implemented to see that change. So if you need anyone there... <laughs> well, absolutely. Keep 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 pressing and keep campaigning, and it's voices like the, yours and indeed your listeners and your viewers that we need. And just thank you. I suppose my my last question for you is if you can, you know, we look back at sort of ten, maybe twenty years ago, no equality act, no autism act, and how far we've come from the awareness and the and the acceptance. What would you like to see in the next 10, 20 years? You know, what what would be, you know, a, a great sort of milestone, do you think, for education yeah. and employment? Well, for me, I think seeing that figure get up to at least five out of 10, and who knows, even higher, but, you know, in the next few years, I want to see progress by 2030 uh, that makes a real change to lives. I also want to see mental health act reform to make it very clear that whilst autistic people can, of course, develop mental health conditions, the two are different and Absolutely. that we shouldn't lump everything together, particularly important when it de when we deal with the 2000 or, or so autistic people who are being caged in a way that is inhumane and wrong. We need to reform the system of finance so that the money follows the patient, and not the other way around. Um, and I also want to see a situation where we aren't so dependent on that diagnosis, that there is that support for people who might not yet or have a diagnosis, but who clearly have needs that can be met and should be met, not just in education, but in the world of work as well. So the question shouldn't be, are you autistic? It should be, what do you need to make you a better employee? What do you need for your business to flourish? What do you need? What support do you need in order to work smarter? Those are the real questions. And I've been looking beyond the condition and to looking to the person and their potential is the way we unlock, I think, opportunity for hundreds of thousands of people who uh, are autistic. No, I couldn't put it better myself. As I say, we've, you know, thank you ever so much for obviously coming on and telling us yeah. your story and sharing you know, your daughter's journey and your journey and, you know, thank you for everything that you do. Um, you know, again, it's really nice to have that that voice in Parliament sometimes where you can feel quite um, sort of neglected at times. So it's quite nice to have that voice. Not at all. It's lovely to see you again. And uh, Max, keep well and keep going. And um, I wish you and your viewers all the best. And guys, that does conclude this year's Autism Connections, which concludes this year's Autism Acceptance Week. I want to thank everyone that came on the show. It's been a brilliant series and I really couldn't have done it without any of the guests this year. I know I said it was the last episode in the episode before, the interview that was in person with Paul Isaacs, which was brilliant. But, you know, at the same time, I had so many people lined up and I wanted to interview as many people as I can. And I had the opportunity to interview Sir Robert Buckland and it's just I, I could not turn that down. So this year we had seven episodes instead of the traditional sort of six. But guys, none of that matters. Thank you ever so much for watching as always. And thank you to all my guests for being Mark Rist, being Steph Ackerman, Carl Harvey, Alex Manners. Sir Robert Buckland, Paul Isaacs and Penny Taylor. Thank you all so much for coming on. It really means the world. And guys, thank you all for watching. Thank you guys. Take care and goodbye for now.